welcome friends to this very special day the bandara of my master great master azur maharaj baba sawan singh i celebrate this day every year after his passing away in the physical body on the 2nd of april 1948 we celebrate bandara as a day of bandar abundance it's the abundance of grace that flows from him which is visible and felt by everybody and that is what we celebrate we are not celebrating the death of a person because for those who were initiated by him he never died on the 2nd of april 1948 he became more alive than he was even when his physical body in his physical body we had to travel a long distance to go and have his darshan for a few minutes we had to wait for uh, for days to get a chance to hear his discourses after 2nd of april 1948 we could see him every day any any time 24/7 it's a very big thing we could have done that even earlier he made a provision for that that if we do a little more homework that we can see a perfect living master in his radiant form within ourselves again 24/7 but we were not very good at our homework and the simple instructions he gave looked so difficult to follow he said meditate regularly we skipped so many days he said meditate one tenth of your time is two and a half hours we hardly were able to sit for half an hour sometimes one hour once in a while we tried very hard that maybe eight hours of meditation might do better but those experiments were all mental experiments with our thoughts thinking that if we make our more effort we'll get more after some time we realized that the effort that we are making is not giving any real results there is something else happening why is he asking us to make this effort to meditate when we try hard we don't get anything we don't even see him inside we don't have his radiant vision inside which he promises then what is the problem what is missing something is missing and we discovered that what is missing is the truth the truth is not meditation the truth is not effort the truth is love love and devotion the spiritual path is nothing but love and devotion takes such a long time to realize that because the mind is so trained to make effort to get everything that we thought effort will do everything a very close disciple of great master who is written some nice books upon by calling them heaven on earth his name was daryai lal daryai lal was a judge in the state of kapurthala he was also finance minister of the state for some time he had held very high positions he had also provided a transportation in his motor car when the great master made his very first visit to kapurthala very good disciple of his and one day he retired and came to great master and said master i have retired i want to do seva for you now great master said you are an educated person you have held high positions in government you can take any job you can be chairman of our corporation of our trust you can be secretary of this trust you can handle anything he said no sir i only want to be your doorman 
I want to stand outside your door and give me that seva, please. And great master said, so be it. The rest of his life, he stood behind, he stood in front of the door of the great master. That was his seva. He enjoyed it. He enjoyed looking at the people who would come to see great master. The joy in their faces just to see him. The tears in their eyes. The devotion that they could show clearly visible on their faces. He enjoyed that role very much. He said, this is the greatest seva I could have got to see and be inspired by the love and devotion people can have for this great master. But after a few years, he felt that he has been doing this seva, but no meditation. So he walked up to great master and said, Master, I have been enjoying this seva you gave me to stand outside your door. But I did not get a chance to meditate. I want to catch up with that. I understand, Master, that you every year in the summer you go to a hill station, Dalhousie, up in the hills where you have a nice house there. And I understand you are not going this year. May I have the privilege of taking the keys of your house and going there and meditating for three months, non-stop to make up for all the loss that I have had so far by not meditating. Great Master smiled, said, here are the keys. Go and meditate. So he went to Delousy and he went and opened the door of Great Master with great anticipation. As he entered, three more people came up. They said, we are plumbers. We have to do some work. We're waiting for somebody to come. They began to knock on the pipes there. Two minutes later, somebody else came. There was so much distraction. Every day he tried to meditate and he could not meditate. The harder he tried, the more there were distractions. He said he wasted his three months and could not achieve anything by trying hard to meditate and came back and gave the keys back to great master. Said, master, I failed. I failed. I tried very hard, but I failed. I could get nothing. I could not handle those distractions that came. And great master smiled and said, no, Dariyailal, you passed. You passed the test. The test was to reveal to you that meditation and your struggle will not give you anything. The distractions that we face are distractions for everybody. It is distractions, trying to mechanically do meditation, trying to put more time, does not give us anything. He is not alone. I can myself testify to that. So many of us have tried that if we do mechanical meditation by the clock, by the hours, we get tired of meditating. What do we get out of it? But one little change that you meditate with love and devotion, you get everything. It's not the meditation part. It's the love and devotion that can accompany meditation. Therefore, if you meditate, make meditation a means of conversation with your master. Meditation is withdrawing your attention to the third eye center behind the eyes. Sit there. Have conversation with your master. If you can't see him, remember when you met him. You can always recall. You can recall when you last saw him. You can recall when you were initiated. You can recall so many events. Recall the actual mom moments when you spent. It's not imagining something. It is recalling. When you recall the master, this is what he was saying, this is what I heard. And when that comes up inside, not outside, inside, that picture of the master, which you are merely remembering, turns into a live picture. And the master continues to talk to you beyond what he talked in your memory. So that is why he is always available. But it's very easy to have that conversation if you are using that opportunity to have a nice conversation about your devotion, about your love, how you feel. 
what are also going on in your life how many miracles you have just experienced share them with the master there are so many things we can do it's all a path of love and devotion it's not a path of mechanical meditation and there's a good reason for that the reason is that any kind of meditation any kind of effort we make is made with the mind the mind is not interested in leaving the attachments and desires it has already created for so many lifetimes in this physical world therefore the mind is opposing our going within and going beyond it so how can we use the mind to go beyond the mind all effort all meditation of every kind whatsoever that i have ever seen or experienced is only a mental exercise and that is why it's not spiritual meditation is not a spiritual activity spiritual activity is love and devotion period meditation is a means to validate that there are experiences beyond our physical world there are experiences which can take you into different dimensions those are validations great master used to call meditation a thermometer he says we use a thermometer to measure the temperature in fever thermometer does not give fever it's only a measurement tool therefore spiritual progress does not happen with the thermometer it does not happen with the mind it happens with the spirit with the soul when we experience love it's experienced by the soul not by the mind these are two distinct parts in our consciousness right now in the physical plane it's a very distinct experience of the mind thoughts rationality logic trying to make sense of things trying to put sense perceptions together these are all mental faculties that we use but love is not a mental faculty love is an experience of the spirit of the soul there are other experiences also of the soul such as intuition instant awareness of certain things gut feelings those are spiritual experiences appreciation of beauty sudden appreciation of things those are spiritual experiences the difference between the two is very simple mental experience takes time spiritual experience does not spiritual experiences are spontaneous mental experiences are connected with thought and every thought takes time even the smallest thought takes time therefore the mind cannot operate without time the spirit operates without time and that is why the spiritual experiences are what count and love is a spiritual experience when we say love and devotion when we experience intense love the devotion comes automatically in our hearts in our spirit and that is why we say love and devotion is the true spirituality i have often referred to the case of one of my friends his name was hira singh he lived in a town called ludhiana in punjab and he had a foundry a little factory to manufacture something and he and i were initiated by the great master about the same time so many years later he was a very good disciple masters would come to his house next to his factory outside he had a house with a large compound and master would give discourses in his house not only great master came to his house many other masters also came not necessarily of the same lineage he would invite any master to come and give talks in his house many years later i had moved to united states and a friend of mine wanted to go to india with me and i said i'll take you show you the dera where i spent time with great master i'll also show you some very beautiful uh, disciples of great master who are still alive and i decided to take him to ludhiana and meet hira singh we went to hira singh's house and a master one of the current masters of that time was giving a discourse in the compound in the yard of that house 
and we stood uh, at the entrance and we saw the crowd and the master was talking. So somehow the master recognized us. So he called us, gave a sign like this. So I and my friend, we walked up and they, we said, Master, finish your discourse. I brought a friend from the United States and he wanted to meet you. So I uh, meet the host here, Hira Singh. So after this course, we'll spend time with you. Master said, Sat Sang finished, this course over, and he got up. This impressed my friend a lot, that I had some influence with somebody. Anyway, it finished, and then I met so many friends of mine, Hira Singh friends, all disciples of different masters. And they began to ask me about how is the United States, how is America, great master predicted, spirituality will go there. They asked several questions. And I was giving answers as best as I could. And some asked some spiritual questions also about meditation. I answered like I do now. I was just answering questions. At the end, Hira Singh comes up to me. And he says, I have a question to ask you. I said, yes, my friend. What is your question? He said, my question is that you and I have been initiated by the same master. We were given instructions by the master what to do. I have followed his instructions. I have been meditating two and a half hours every day since my initiation. This is more than 40 years ago. When this happened, it was more than 40 years later. He says, for 40 years, I have been meditating. Regularly, I have followed very strict the diet, vegetarian diet. I have led a very strict moral life. I have tried to follow the best rules, lead a good life. And after 40 years, I must tell you, I have never seen these inner planes. Sometimes I get some light, sometimes I feel calm, sometimes I feel good, but I have not had any of the experiences. As you seem to have something, Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to answer these questions that you are answering. How come there is so much discrimination between the two of us that I got nothing in spite of following the instructions? I don't know how well you followed, but you seem to have got something out of it. I said, Hira Singh, let me give you a secret today. The secret is when people ask me a question, I pretend to know the answer, but I don't. I refer the question to my master. And the master gives me the answer. I convey to them, they think it's my answer. It's not mine. It's master doing it. It's great master's answers that I am giving to people, not mine. He said, then why don't you put my question also to great master? I said, I will. Certainly, I'll put your question to great master. And I'll get you an answer. He said, do you have to sit with eyes closed to get the answer? You can get it just like that. I said, no, no, I have to make an appointment. <laughs> it takes time, you know. The great master is not so free. He is a busy person. He says, how long will it take to get an answer? I said, about six months. Does it take that long? I said, he's a busy person. This is called a whisper to you now. The reason why I said was because I was going back to the United States and was to come back in six months. Anyway, I left. My friend came back with me. After six months, I went again. And I said, I have to go and see him. So I went to Hira Singh. I said, got the answer. I said, first of all, tell me that you have met so many masters. Why didn't you ask them this very question? Why are you waiting 40 years to ask the question? He said, I did. I asked that master. What did he say? He said, he smiled and said, continue your meditation with love and devotion. He said, what did the other master say? He, they said the same thing. Continue your meditation with love and devotion. I said, I got you the latest answer. He said, what did the master answer? I said, great master gave the answer. He was saying, continue your meditation with love and devotion. Same answer. He said, but haven't I been doing that? I said, no, you haven't been doing that. You have been continuing your meditation, period. The answer was, continue your meditation with love and devotion. Each of the masters said that. 
and you missed out the love and devotion part. You thought meditation was a mechanical exercise that you have just to close your eyes, sit there and wait for something to happen. It doesn't. The mind is too powerful. The mind will draw you out all the time. It's a very big struggle. And once I even, I remember telling great master, the mind is a very big struggle. We fight it all the time. He said, but that's what the mind likes, to fight. You are just giving in to the mind by fighting the mind. I said, how do we get over it? I said, we fight the mind. Every time I want to sit here, the mind takes me somewhere else. I try to come back. No, let me be back in third eye center. Mind says, what about that particular thing you forgot? Keeps on taking me out. I keep on fighting back. And struggle, this fight goes on again and again. Every fight, fight, fight for two and a half hours. I am tired completely. What kind of meditation is this? The great master said, that's right. You won every fight, but every battle you won, you lost the war. The mind likes to fight. It kept you engaged. That is why it doesn't work. Now, these are such simple things. We have all gone through these things without realizing. What is the true spiritual way of getting to our own soul, to our own spirit? Fighting the mind doesn't help us. So we have to learn something different. The great master explained that. He said, you have to learn to ignore the mind, not fight the mind. Ignore the mind. When you are sitting in the third eye center, feeling that you are sitting right behind your eyes, at that time, Thoughts come, ignore them. Let them come. Almost like as if the mind is a separate entity which you have empowered to be able to think and talk to you. Say, you do your thinking, I am going to think this. Have a parallel, parallel conversation. Allow the mind to think what it wants to. You keep your attention directly on what is your conversation with master. Mind is thinking other thing. You continue. Raise your voice, if necessary, inside. Assert yourself. Ignore the mind. It needs some practice. But I was able to do it. If you try, you can do it. That you can ignore the mind. And if you ignore the mind, a reasonable amount of time, the mind becomes so tame, it does not even try to distract you. So there's a way out. But just fighting the mind doesn't take us anywhere. These are some simple things that we learned. But what was the experience we had with this man, the great master? I have met many masters, many yogis, swamis, masters, spent a lot of time with them. I call him not the great master, I call him the greatest master. His love, I cannot define. It just pulled you. Something would happen just by his presence. I remember Julian Johnson, an American surgeon, going to India. First time he spends just a couple of hours with the great master. Couldn't say much, as if he became speechless. And he wrote back the same night to his friends in America. If I can get nothing more than what I've got today, it's enough. That's the power of this man. The power of the love flowed from his eyes. Love flowed from every gesture that he made. Love flowed from his presence. You can't imagine. The kindest person I've seen. Of course, some incidents happened when I couldn't see that kindness. And that incident I can never forget is the harshest incident of my life. It's more harsh than any accidents I've had, any illnesses I've had. Those are minor things compared to one experience I had which broke my faith in this master. I must share with you. At that time, when this incident happened, the number of followers had grown. And therefore, there were some crowds. And when master went out to walk, 
there were crowds around him. So just to keep the crowds on the side, the sevadars, those who were serving, would form a line both sides so the master could walk without being disturbed in the middle. I was one of the few people, about eight or nine people, who were following master. We were allowed, some very lucky people got a chance to just stay behind master and walk with him. I was walking behind the master along with a few others. And one old lady, she broke the line of those sevadars from the left side, rushed in and put her head on master's feet as he was walking. The master had his cane in his hand and he beat her so badly. I said, this cannot be a master. So much anger. It was terrible. I said, how can I? What is her fault? She's expressing her love and devotion to the master, putting her head on his feet, and he beats her up. I couldn't believe it. It was a very, very strong thing that hit me bad. And I said, this cannot be a master. I have just been fooled by him. A master who can do that cannot be what we thought he is. Where's the love gone? Where's the compassion gone? Where's the appreciation of love and devotion gone? I said, maybe he's after all a human being. He made the mistake. And he might be feeling sorry that he did this. So I moved up a little ahead to see his face. And he was smiling. That is called adding insult to injury. <laughs> I left him. <coughs> I left him because the lady had been suddenly picked up by those sevadas and taken aside. And there was a little platform on the side and she was sitting on that and a lot of crowd gathered. All the people went to see why she was beaten up by a master. And I also went there to see her, left the master. He said, he's not a master. Let me see what happened to the lady. And I have never seen a lady beaming with greater joy than that lady. And she was saying, how lucky I am. In two seconds, he took away all my karma. I said, how could that be the effect on this woman? Then I realized that we can never fully understand a master and his actions. First of all, masters act so ordinary, so human, that they never reveal in their human activity they are anybody different than ordinary people. He showed his ordinariness in an extreme way. And she said it was not ordinary at all. It was the most extraordinary event that happened to her. Now please, when I tell the story, some people had come to me last time, I tell the story and said, hit us with the cane. <laughs> No, please. That's not the intention of telling the story. All I am saying is that we cannot understand. And yet I realized that that was a unique event for me to understand that masters can be very playful. They can make, a, make us feel so much at home that they are like us. Why do they do that? Why do perfectly masters? And I saw that happen again and again. This was an extreme example. But I saw it ordinariness in many other things. I remember a very small thing. There was a bridge in a mountain resort called Karuki Bad. It master used to go in the summer sometimes. And we had to cross a bridge. We had to pay one rupee as a toll on the bridge. So I decided to cheat the toll people and escape because the river stream was very little less water. I took my bike into the stream and I went through and did not pay the toll. And I went and told great master. I said, I cheated, didn't pay the toll. He said, great, very good. <laughs> I said, he, he likes my cheating. <laughs> Very simple, small, small events of life. I can recall all my life and tell you 
how he was most ordinary like myself like yourself like anybody of us and yet totally extraordinary in his love in his compassion in his in his grace that flowed from him no comparison with anybody that i can find no comparison i came to the united states and i said in in india many of these people who loved him would say nothing can compare with him we have never seen and the punjabi word they used was nahi risa nahi risa that mean no comparison no comparison i landed in new york a song was playing we said nothing can compare with you i said do they know about get master already <laughs> i didn't know the song and nothing to do with get master but look at the coincidence i said this country already knows that nothing can compare with a perfect living master a great master like him his kindness his love went so deep into us and he gave some sampling glimpses to us and then it was only through his grace we got everything i must confess that our own efforts had very little role yet he said make effort every day he would say and he had a, a professor with him and the professor would he said professor you tell them professor you have to meditate every day as great master would smile i remember those days why was he emphasizing or through the professor emphasizing you must meditate every day reason was simple to satisfy the mind our mind does not accept that you can get anything without effort it's indoctrinated for several lifetimes that whatever you want to achieve you have to struggle for it you have to work for it and then you get it it applies the same formula to spiritual truths even though it does not apply there it still tries that therefore we meditate and we discover the futility of meditation and then only we say there's something else going on here but we have to meditate to reach that point that is why we cannot keep our mind at bay we cannot ignore the mind till we have given it a chance to try fully okay try all your best that is why meditation is for the mind love and devotion for the soul it's a combination we need when we are in human form over here as time goes on we discover a very strange truth very strange truth i want to share with you when we say i want to meditate where does this come from when he says i am going to meditate i want to find something where is that coming from it's an extension of the seeking of the soul the mind is being told that there is something good you will get maybe better than what you have outside if you meditate the mind is ready to give a chance to try i want to meditate you think at least that part was decided by your mind if you go higher up in awareness at the end you find it's all grace you find it was grace that made you say i want to meditate you'll be surprised that when we say we meditate hard it's also grace in the beginning it looks 100% of your effort at the end it's 100% grace even the desire to meditate comes only because of grace and why does how does grace come grace does not come because we have asked for it or something grace comes because we are on the marked list of a particular master when we are on the marked sheep of a shepherd of a master the grace starts flowing from the very first moment when we have a seeking in our heart the seeking comes from grace the effort comes from grace the all the meditation we do comes from grace the feeling of love and devotion comes from grace 
and the achievement of all knowledge, true knowledge to the top comes from grace. I cannot overemphasize the importance of grace. Grace is everything. That is why I think this is a very special day. It's a very special day because grace is flowing like nobody can imagine. And I can see it. Hope you take full advantage. Keep your cups inside. Toward the inside. You have done enough looking out. We spent a whole life looking out. Spent today looking in and seeing your master. If you have been very fortunate, privileged to be initiated by your master. Today is the day. Completely put your time, attention. Today, we are expecting some snow. So you can't run out too much. But you can run in more today. Take time today to get the full advantage of a special day. Grace is flowing like you haven't seen before. You will experience it if you put your attention within today. Master's message is very simple. Great master teaching is the simplest I've ever seen. It says the entire truth, the ultimate truth lies within ourselves, nowhere outside. You can run all your life everywhere in the world. You will not find what you can find inside. Go within. Go within yourself. If you think you are a body, like now you are thinking, we are just a physical body, go within this body. Where? Limited area. Not all over the body. Don't have to waste your time on the energy centers if you want to have higher awareness. If you are interested in developing energy, energetic feelings, being able to have, have out-of-body experiences in this very physical universe, and to have power to read the minds of people in this physical universe, want to have control over people in this physical universe, you can go into these centers for that. But if your intention is to find yourself, to find the truth about everything, about the creation, about yourself, about God, about the Creator, go within yourself at the third eye center. That's where you're operating from now. When we are awake, our consciousness is operating from the head, behind the eyes, between the ears, third eye center. Imagination is great. You can use imagination to imagine you are there. You lift yourself up and place yourself there. That is the place to meditate. That is the place to have a conversation with your master. That is the place to experience the love of a master. That is the place where you will find the real love that you are waiting to experience. It's all right there at Third Eye Center. And that's within you in the physical body. Behind the physical eyes. When you can imagine yourself inside, you can do whatever you like inside. You can fly, you can walk, you can talk, you can do anything. Not with this body. This body is quiet. With your imaginative in self inside. The more you spend time in that, the more you are withdrawing your attention from outside, even from your attachment outside, the more time you are spending. And if you st spend time with your master and feel his love, you will see time will fly very fast. And you will enjoy. Enjoy flying with your master in the sky that can open up inside. It's imagination. But it's good. The imagination of being within yourself is actually withdrawing your attention within yourself. And that's all you need. The simplicity of the process is go within yourself. When we go within and can stabilize and do a lot of things with the inner self, flying, standing, exercising, dancing, anything inside, then we find that we can stay there longer whenever we like. It becomes very pleasurable. Meditation is difficult. 
Staying there is easy and pleasurable. And that is meditation, actually. To be there, to pull your attention there. If you can then pull your attention within the third eye of your inner self, is going further within. You go further within, you'll discover the whole nature of this universe. You discover how it's being set up. You discover how it's being created from there. It's not being created from outside and we are experiencing it. We are creating from there and then experiencing it at the same time. The creation and experiencing of creation is simultaneous. And therefore, we can't know what is what. But at, at least by going there, you know what is what. You find out the reasons. You find out exactly how this universe is being experienced by us right here. It's a very big step, but it's all going within. Nothing outside. Suppose you go within further, not anywhere outside, further within that being, which is yourself, which is your own mind and yourself. You'll find that you will find out the nature of the universal mind. You will find out you are in the top of the three worlds and discover all the secrets of the worlds. But then, that's the maximum you can do. Because all these things I'm suggesting you do, which means make an effort. Which means you're using your mind to do these things. Up to that point, to go within, up to that point, you can do with your mind. But that's the end of the mind. That is the mind. How do we go to the soul now? That you cannot. If you have been experiencing love and devotion for your master, starting from outside here, and then inside there, and then further inside there, if that has been part of your process of meditation, then you will feel a pull of master's love. And that pull which you can feel slightly here, so strong there, it takes you beyond your mind and reveals to you your soul. The soul is nothing but a unit of consciousness. The soul is life. Without the soul, nothing can have life. Neither the mind, nor the senses, nor the physical body. If you look at yourself from there and see who am I, what am I, and you are doing all this in a physical body, you're not dead. You haven't given a physical body and given the other bodies. You're just having an experience of withdrawal of awareness of these bodies. That means you're still having the physical body exactly like this. You're just sitting in a meditation, this physical body. You look from there, what is it I'm experiencing? You'll experience that the soul, which is life, is generating the mind in order to have experience of vastness, space and time. And you can see it being created right there. You can also then see that the mind can perceive everything is being created. Direct perception. Everything that's being created. You see, so many universes being created. Not this universe. Many universes. And you have access to all those other universes from there. It's an amazing experience. And then, then you see that the perception is being built into a separate array of senses, seeing, nirat, being separated from surat, listening, for separation. Seeing and hearing, two basic things, they are separated first and they can be used in the causal plane. Then you separate more and touch, taste, smell become separate and you go into the astral plane. You put them, pack them all up in a matter, physical matter, they become physical body. Going from this way, that way, is going to open up new experiences. But looking back from there, you will see exactly how everything is being created. You get answers to all your questions. There will be no question left unanswered because all the questions we ask are because of our ignorance of all this that is happening inside us. The whole truth, complete truth, lies inside, nothing outside. 
And of course, from that point, the master, if he's a perfect living master, master is with you all the time. If he's initiated you, perfect living master, when he initiates, does not want you to have this journey just by yourself. He wants you to have the journey while you are accompanied by him. And therefore, the journey of accompaniment starts from third eye center. When you go within and have the first few experiences of flying in the air, the great, the, your master appears and you go with the master. These journeys that I am talking of, of going further within and seeing new things, is in the company of master who is visible and with you, like a friend, like he's out here. Here we can't meet him all the time. There is with you all the time. That's the big difference. But when you go within and go to the real spiritual region of the soul, master is still in the same spiritual region as a soul. You are a soul. The master is a soul. In the causal plane, you are soul and mind. The master is soul and mind. Astral plane, you are a radiant form. All the things can be seen in darkness. Your body can be seen. Master's body can be seen. So we call it the radiant form of the master. And this again is some people are writing to me. I want radiant form of master ASAP. <laughs> As if radiant form is something different than the form we see. The radiant form does not mean there's some lights flowing out of it. Somebody sent me a painting also. Lights coming out of the body of a Master, and say that's the radiant form. I said, I never saw it. I saw a form that could be seen in utter darkness very clearly. So it was obviously radiant. But then I saw that the houses I could see were also radiant. The streets I could see were also radiant there. I myself was also radiant. The radiant form of the Master is merely a description that we are at a stage where you do not need external light to see anything, everything has got its own visibility, its own light. So that is why radiant form is not something very unique you have to find. You start thinking of master and that will become the radiant form if your attention is withdrawn. The moment you are less aware of the physical body, more aware of that, you can call upon the radiant form when you like. So don't think it's a very special thing that will happen, very different form of master will come. It's the same. But you are also radiant form. Similarly, when the causal plane, you have no physical form, you have no astral form, you have no sensory systems, so doesn't the master. He's the same form. When you are a soul, you are a soul. Master is also a soul. Only when you go beyond that, the experience is totally different. All these experiences can be explained as levels of consciousness. All these experiences can be explained as going from one dimension of existence to another. All these can be explained that these are ladders stuff that we can go one stage to another. After the discovery of the soul, the next step is totally different. The next step is to discover that all these stages are part of the total. That nothing was existing outside of the total. That there were no stages. The stages were just an experience generated at the top. With the only one consciousness, one soul, not two. Only one totality of consciousness exists. Everything that we see is happening here, is happening there. Everything happening at every level of awareness that we go through is happening there. It's total, self-contained. There's nothing outside of it. All space and time is created there. All types of creation exist there. It's all happening within consciousness and nothing outside. This is a very big discovery. What happens when we reach there? The master and you merge, become one. You find the master was also the same thing as you, and master knows you are the same thing as the master. Because you are one. All the people you ever met were also one. Everything was one. All things you saw were also one. 
Now, what happens when you get that experience? When you get that experience, you have got the experience of all stages at once. That means you are not now going from one stage to another. Then how do you come back? This can all happen in a physical body. Right to the top is possible in a physical body. And here you discovered the oneness whilst you're still sitting in a separate physical body in a physical universe. Then what happens? You can pick to be anywhere you like with your attention or at all places at the same time. This is not possible except till the top. All other levels will be separate levels. The top makes it all one. And you can be at any level and at all levels. That is why these perfect living masters, like great master, he came, he, I could see he is at all levels. Because people asked him questions. Of any level, he gave a straight answer. He didn't have to think what the answer is. Didn't have to remember what the answer is. He was there to give the answer. These are very rare people. These perfect living masters who are operating at all levels simultaneously. And what are they doing at all levels? It's interesting to see. We're just talking of our own self, our own journey to totality. What will we see? There are so many souls right here. There are several billion people living on this planet, one single planet. We don't know how many people living in other planets in this, this single universe. There are so many souls spread out all over. Physical universe is very small compared to the others. What's happening to those souls? There are souls in universes which are similar to the physical universe. And there are universes which are not similar. Perfect living masters are working with those souls at every, at every level. We see them sitting here and working with us, few people here, and we don't know how many other souls they're taking care of simultaneously when they're talking to us here. It's a remarkable state. Now these perfect living masters that come from that level of awareness, that kind of knowing all the time, are very rare, very, very rare. Great master used to say that in the very old days, even one master was enough because such seekers were very few. Meditators were many. The seekers of the highest were very few. They had no idea. Even so-called perfect living masters who came several thousand years ago, they came and the whole evolution of awareness had reached a point that if you could go inside and see a heaven, it was considered to be your true home. At that time, they were called perfect living masters because that was all that people with their own evolution could reach. Don't forget that the evolution of human being has started with a stone man. The stone man's great discovery was, oh, I separated two stones. This is two. A big thing for him. He got so excited like a new software engineer will make a new software and say, great, same excitement. But there's a, today we don't think there's much excitement in putting two stones together. See, evolution of awareness has also taken place with the evolution of a human being. Today, we've got developed an intelligence that we can even put intelligence in outside robots and we can make them even more intelligent than ourselves. So this level at which we have grown our ability to know our mind, to ability to know our thoughts, to ability to know the thoughts cannot go beyond time and space. And things like that have come up, which is not possible in those days. So a person who could just take you high, one step up was a perfect living master of that time. As a group, those who could take you to the universal mind were definitely considered perfect masters because the whole universes were coming from there. They told you where you belong. But to go beyond and say that the Mind is not the end and the soul is different from mind, came later. And so now, in the time to come, there will be even more advanced masters. They will be able to tell you how totality is working and describe it. I have not seen many masters describe 
totality because we can't understand it. If I were to say in zero time, zero space, some million people I saw having a great dance, nobody can understand it. We need space for the million people. According to our mental concept today, our mind is not developed that much to go beyond. It will develop more. So these are kinds of things if you look back. Now the beauty is, if you are able to reach that state of totality of consciousness, you can not only see the history of the evolution of awareness and mankind, but the future of, of the mankind and the future of the development of mind. The whole of the past, present, and future becomes clear how it's being created through the mind. Through a universal mind, all this is being laid out. Imagine that we sitting as ordinary human beings in a physical body have such a huge capacity, such a huge potential to be able to see everything like that. What a great boon to us. As human beings with simple things, like being found by a master, just by seeking, just by seeking within, we are found by a master. We cannot find a master. But when our seeking leads to being found by a master, the luckiest thing that can happen. And all that I'm sharing with you becomes possible. By the way, it is not something that just because these masters are very rare, that the potential for becoming a master is rare, not at all. All of us have the same thing in us, the same totality of consciousness, no difference. We are all coming from the same origin, no difference. All of us have the full capacity to be perfectly masters. No difference between anyone, no matter where you are born, no matter where you live, no matter what your gender, your color of the skin, no matter your culture, no matter your religion, all are equipped for the same thing. And that is why. It's such a great joy for me to share with you what a great master like Baba Savan Singh can give us. And he gave to so many of us such a possibility that we never could imagine even existed. We are so divided up. We have both glue that puts us together and scissors that cut us apart. The scissors are the mind, the glue is the soul. When you go to the spiritual thing, you feel close, joy, love. When you use mind, it divides. That is why even some philosophers have said, the mind is an instrument only for analysis. To analyze something, you have to break it up. The soul, the spiritual self of how the intuitive self, they call not the spiritual self, the intuitive self is to join together. It's synthesis. One is analysis, one is synthesis. The mind is a tool for analysis. Our soul is a tool for synthesis. That is why intuition synthesizes and thinking analyzes. So these are all our equipment we all have. And we are using the analytical equipment all the time, trying to break open. He give a nice toy to a child who's growing up. He'll break to see how it works. We adults also break things to see how they work. We break ideas, we break things, we break thoughts, we break everything to see how does it work. To break apart is only one part. We think we are all different. We're divided. And sometimes we read in the books, we are all one. Yes, we are all one, but I don't like those two people. <laughs> this is the kind of oneness we experience with division. So that is why what is dividing us is our mind. Dividing us from each other. Dividing us from God. Dividing us from ourselves. It's our mind that is dividing. And therefore, if I were to say simply what is coming in the way of our total enlightenment, it's the mind, nothing else. Nobody else is coming in the way. If you say that we have friends and enemies, the only enemy is single one, our own mind. No, no enemy anywhere exists. 
Friends exist everywhere. Mind is only one enemy. All are friends. I once had a very interesting seminar. I asked people that for one week, just smile all the time. Whether you like it or not, whether you're angry or you're sad, just smile. Everywhere you go, just smile. Keep on smiling. And next week we'll meet and we'll find out how many people you met who were also smiling like you and how many people you met who were angry at you. Because we meet all kinds of people every day, every week. So this seminar was to just smile all the time at everybody. Just smile and talk nicely, smile talk nicely. So after one week we met and the whole group of the seminar said, everybody was smiling whom we met. How can that be? How can one person's smile turn everybody into smiles? That's the truth because a smile represents that you love, that you're coming from the intuitive self. And anger is mind. So therefore, when you are just even faking up this, it still works. There is a master's teaching. He talks of devotion. He says, you can't always know what is love and devotion. But you can pretend. Sometimes you can pretend that you are loving. Pretend you are devoted. And he says in Hindi, the script is in Hindi, he says, Jhuti Sachi Kar Bhakti. Whether it's true or fake, try your devotion. Even fake devotion will become real if you practice it. So that is why there are so many hints given to us how all this can be achieved. This is a great moment for me to share with you this great bandara of great master, the abundance of grace. His teaching was simple, as I told you, go within yourself. We have the great opportunity. You have come here because you are the seekers. I guarantee if you seek, you find. There is no question about it. I have seen it all my life. Whoever was seeking inside, found. Not one failure. Those who were searching did not find. Sometimes they were finding something, some they were not. Searching is with the mind, seeking with the soul. Seeking comes from where you can't even know where you are seeking from. Because you have kept your attention so far away from your own self. that The seeking when it comes from within yourself, you don't know where it's coming from. It's the same place where love affects you. So I'm very happy to share this with you. And to give you great master, Baba Savan Singh, his blessings today. So please take that home. Today, use this day for absorbing the grace and love that is flowing. I can see it all over. Take full advantage of it. I'll be very happy to join you again next year on a Bandara. So thank you very much for joining me. And I'm very happy to share these thoughts with you. Thank you. All blessings.